Just for lack of interest, I'll come to you today more than you can call the next witness. Thank you, Ron. You call Judge Williams. All right, good morning, sir. We're going to have you come up to the witness stand, which is to my right and to your left. Now, um, Mr. Lack, I apologize. There's some technical difficulties with my feet. No um, but you, you can uh, start with the rain. Thank you. You know, Mr. Williams, there's water up there. I think there's cups behind that screen. I'm there. There's cups here if you need them. Thank you. Mr. Williams, are you currently employed? I am. And where are you currently employed? Springfield Armory in Geneseo, Illinois. And how long have you worked for Springfield Armory? 29 years. What's your current title? I'm, I'm the director of R&D, research and development. Okay. And uh, as director of the research and development, what, what sort of duties does that position have? Uh, we design firearms, we modify firearms, we uh, test firearms, but basically we design uh, variants of current firearms or new firearms from scratch. Also in field armory firearms? Yes. Now, did you hold any positions prior to being a research and development director? I did. Previous to that, I was the director of the custom pistol shop. There we built uh, custom pistols for, <coughs> excuse me, for competitors, law enforcement, uh, enthusiasts, but they're hand-built, hand-fitted, high-end custom guns. And how long were you in that position for? Uh, I was the director from 94, uh, 96 to uh, 2017. And uh, any prior positions at prior positions prior to that? Prior to that, I was a custom pistol smith in the custom shop from 1991 to 94. And uh, now to become like the position of pistol smith, is there formal training or education, or is that more on the job? Training? It's more on the job training. Uh, I was a pistol smith before I started at Springfield, and. Uh, would you say that's standard? How you become pistol? It is mostly a, a custom pistol smiths are sort of a niche group in the in the industry. There's not a lot of formal training for that. It's uh, on the, mainly on the job training or personal experience. Now, do you hold any patents for the design of firearms? I do. And what are those? I own. Uh, I have maybe seven patents and uh, four or five pending patents on a myriad of different firearm designs and upgrades and features that go on pistols. I have a patent on a complete pistol <clears throat> we refer to as the EMP at Springfield. I designed and uh, built the uh, original prototypes for that for that line. And I've got several other patents on safety devices and gun locks and attachment methods and a myriad of things. So you have designed handguns for Springfield Armory then? Yes. <clears throat> have you ever written any manuals? I have. And what are those? I write most of the safety manuals for most of our firearms. Are you a liaison for any overseas manufacturers? I am. And who's that? Uh, HS Product in Karlovac, Croatia. Are Springfield guns manufactured in Croatia? Some are. The XD line of guns are manufactured in Croatia. Do you ever conduct any trainings? I have. Can you tell the jury about those trainings? 
Sure, I've been a firearms instructor at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. <coughs> doing firearms training through the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. And then I've done various other trainings at smaller police departments and some personal training for gunsmiths in general. Are you a member of any professional organizations? I am. And what are those? Um, I'm a member of the American Pistol Smiths Guild. I'm a member of the American Handgunner Club 100. Um, I was Pistol Smith of the Year in 2006. I am um, NRA member, State Rifle Association, and several other affiliations. Now, as part of your duties, either as a pistol smith or in a research and development or director of the custom shop, uh, do you test firearms for operability? I do. Um, do you test firearms for, let me ask this, are people able to send firearms that they purchase from Springfield Armory back to Springfield? They are. And, and when that happens, are you able to test for repairs or anything that can be wrong with the gun? We do. We also upgrade uh, firearms to a higher level. And but we do repair and, and diagnostics and whatever the customer may choose. And about how many firearms have you tested, uh, tested in your career? Hundreds of thousands. And what about how many rounds do you think you've shot off? Oh, I've shot in excess of a million, probably between two to five. <clears throat> and does part of your operability test include the force used to pull a particular trigger on a gun? It does. And does part of your operability test include uh, force used to deactivate any trigger safeties or safeties on the gun? It does. And would that include grip safety? Yes. Are you familiar with the Springfield XDM 4.59 millimeter pistol? I am. And have you ever testified in a court of record such as the Superior Court or the Court of Common Pleas? I have. And how many times would you say you've testified? A handful. Four or five to six. I'm not. I'm really not sure. Over the years, there's been several. And what sort of cases do you testify? I testify uh, mainly in court. I testify in cases similar to this, criminal cases. And I've heard like civil cases as well? Some civil cases, but uh, we don't have many. Um, and when you've testified in a court record, you qualified as an expert in these courts? Um, Your Honor, related to witnesses, qualifications, and experience, I would ask that. He did that as an expert witness in the field of handgun design and operability for Springfield firearms. Hey, we walk here. What's the proper? Handgun and design and operability for Springfield, specifically Springfield firearms. No, Judge, um, if you could just do the charge, then. Of course. So, the court finds uh, that Mr. Williams is uh, qualified as an expert based on his education, training, and experience in handgun design and operability for Springfield firearms. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, witness is being offered as an expert witness. As with uh, any witness, you are um, able to accept this testimony or reject this testimony based on your uh, review of, uh, of, his, uh, of his testimony in court. Um, with that, Mr. Lackey, may continue your uh, examination. Thank you. Thank you. Just for identification, just in case you did, Mr. Williams, I'm going to show you what you marked as S113. Just keep it up here, and if we need to get into it, you can go in. Uh, just previously you testified on for operability. Now, can you please explain to the jury how you would testify or how you would test a Springfield handgun, specifically the model XDM 4.5 9mm pistol? Well, it would depend on the circumstances that we received, you know, what the, what the reason the customer returned the gun to us for. Uh, in this situation, uh, we were uh, reached, <laughs> excuse me, the Burlington. Uh, Prosecutor's office reached out to us with some technical questions about this particular firearm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, we volunteered to inspect the pistol. You guys accepted that. 
uh, sent the pistol to us, and then we did a thorough inspection of the gun, which included visual inspection, technical inspection, and test firing of the gun with, with a couple of various types of ammunition. And what does the visual inspection entail? Well, with the visual inspection, when we receive a pistol, we have no idea what the condition of the gun is. So as soon as we take it out of the box, we inspect the gun, clear the gun, make sure it's safe, unloaded, and then we'll field strip the pistol. Look for any abnormalities that might be apparent. Clean the gun with with uh, just compressed air if we need to. We don't want to change anything in the gun, but if it's you know we have to make sure we can see what we're what we're looking for, and inspect all of the components that may have anything to do with the complaint that the customer may have had with the gun. And what about the technical inspection design? The technical inspection we get a little bit deeper. We look at all the components under a uh, Celestron uh, <coughs> digital microscope or a hand magnifying system. We do a hands-on inspection of the tension of the components, make sure that all the components have the proper tension and feel. And then we do a technical further inspection with more specific diagnostic <coughs> to make sure that, that everything that we're looking at functions properly and as intended. And do you do a functional inspection? We do. And what does that mean? The functional inspection, we, <laughs> we refer to the term as dry firing. We take the input, we take the handgun with no ammunition, hand cycle it. This is an auto, this is this auto loading pistol, which has a reciprocating slide on it. We operate the slide, make sure that the grip safety works as it should. Has a trigger safety, we make the trigger safety works as it should. We make sure that the striker system functions as it should and we verify all those functions. And then you also have a test fire? Device. And then we do a test fire with live ammunition, which basically duplicates everything that we've done in the uh, dry fire procedure. Now, are these, uh, are tests such as this performed on firearms before they're sold? <coughs> they are. And this, before a firearm gets sold, is it, it goes through various manufacturing tests? It does. Yeah. Now, if there was a gun that went, that was during that, process, the manufacturing process, the test process, if it wasn't working properly, would it be sold? No. And what would happen if it wasn't working properly? Well, there's there's stages of assembly on these guns, and through every stage of assembly, there's gauging that's done, uh, measurements, testing, if uh, spring tension, if anything in that process is out of specification, uh, we bring it back into specification, and it moves forward along the assembly process, and this goes on until final assembly goes through another visual dry fire inspection, and then they're extensively test fired. Prior to being sold. Prior to being sold. How much of this new mark in the heavens is S46? First, let me ask you if you can that, that box. I do. And what is that? This is a Springfield XD shipping container. And if you wouldn't mind, just open it up and take a look on the inside. I do. And what is that? This is a Springfield XDM 9mm 4-point inch pistol. And have you had an opportunity to view that Springfield I have. firearm? And what are the circumstances that you receive that firearm? I'm sorry, could you say what are, the, what are the circumstances that you receive that firearm? After the conversation I had with the prosecutor's office, uh, they returned the pistol to us. I believe it came in around August 7th. The gun was hand delivered to me. What the year, Judge? What the year was that, sir? Or you said August, that was what year? Uh, bear with me for one moment. Let me ask you. 2018. Did you, did you write a report after you did all your. I did. And mm -hmm. so that was memorialized? Yes. And you're looking at S. Uh, S46. 
S113. <coughs> is that a copy of your report? It is. So if you need to refresh your recollection at all during any of these questions and need to refer to that report, uh, you may do so. I'll read from the report, but you can refer to your recollection. So the question, uh, what year? You said August 2018. 2018? Yes. That's what it says in the report? Yes. And that's the, that's the firearm that you did <coughs> test on, correct? It is. And you know that by looking at the serial number? I do. Now, before we get into the, uh, the test that you performed on that firearm, if you please uh, step down with the firearm and explain to the jury the functionality of that firearm and how it works. I certainly will. semi-auto pistol, meaning, or an auto-loading pistol, meaning that uh, it self-loads the cartridge. Once you charge it, it self-loads the cartridge, and every time you, from the magazine, which is this apparatus here, you load the cartridges into the magazine, this one holds 19 rounds, you insert the magazine into the gun, it loads the cartridge, when you pull the trigger and fire it, it ejects the spin that's one going too fast to stop me. Let me back up just a little bit and show you the, the actually the main components of the gun. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. There's three main sub assemblies to the to the pistol. There's a magazine which holds the ammunition. There's the slide assembly. It's called a slide because as in function of the gun. It, slides back and forth. The slide assembly contains the barrel, the slide, various other parts, <clears throat> and the striker mechanism, which is also known as a firing pin. Then the frame assembly holds the grip frame. It also holds it also holds the grip safety, which is this lever here in the rear. As you can see I'm manipulating it with my finger. Trigger. And then in the center of the trigger is a trigger safety lever. So if you would insert a live mag a magazine with ammunition into the gun, manipulate the side, which loads the which loads the cartridge, <laughs> and then fire the gun. The grip, I mentioned the grip safety earlier. When you grasp the pistol, it automatically disengages the grip safety. When you're ready to fire, you touch the trigger, which disengages the trigger safety. And then you press the trigger all the way to the rear until it fires. If it fires, it will check the cartridge load another one, release the trigger, and it fires again until all the ammunition is, is consumed. <coughs> Now, for this kind of fire, you have to press the grip safety, and you have to press the trigger safety, and you have to depress the trigger completely to the normal firing position or it won't fire. If you don't do any of those, if you miss one of those operations, you cannot fire. Excuse me. And that's the basic function of a semi auto pistol. Hey, can you just explain how the grip safety works? Sure. The grip safety in the rear. <clears throat> the frame also contains the fire, half of the firing mechanism. <laughs> There's a device called a sear in the trigger housing. It basically, triggers a, the trigger is attached to the transfer bar to the sear. The grip safety physically blocks the sear. So if, you, if this is not depressed, it is impossible to pull the trigger to fire the gun. It's mechanically stopped. Again, to depress the trigger, you have to press the, grip, the trigger safety. If you press the side of the trigger, it cannot fire. So three things have to happen that you can see for this to fire. Whenever you grasp the gun in a normal firing position, the grip safety is automatically depressed. You don't have to consciously be aware of that. Same with the trigger safety. 
you touch the trigger safety, it deactivates after a few ounces of pressure, typically four to five. And then you can then it releases the trigger, or you can pull it to the to the firing position. And there's a considerable amount of travel that the trigger moves before it fires, and it's under a certain weight. This pistol is uh, 6.8 pounds to press the trigger to fire. <laughs> so just going back to the inspection we talked about a moment ago, uh, did you perform visual inspection? I did. On that firearm? I did. did that, and what did that entail? Feel stripping the pistol. <laughs> when you feel strip the pistol, you can see all of the action components. You don't have to remove them. They're easily visible. They're easily manipulated. You can feel the tension on them. You can, you can immediately see if anything's out of place, if anything's broken, if anything's out of the ordinary, if the part's been modified or, or uh, is damaged or chipped or defective in any way. Did you see any modifications on this stuff? No. Uh, did you see anything using your words that was out of the norm or no. not normal? No. So, and then did you complete the technical inspection on that? I did. And again, on this particular pistol? On this particular what that, pistol. What did that uh, entail? We checked the tension that it takes to depress the grip safety. We found that to be in the normal range. I believe it was five ounces. Actually, what I'm referring to in my notes is eight ounces. The, the, the minimum is what you would be concerned about. You always want the grip safety exposed. If the gun were pointed down, there has to be enough spring tension to push the grip safety in the normal safe position. But it was within range. We also <coughs> we also tested the force required to deactivate trigger safety. The same thing. It has to have the minimum tension is uh, has to have enough to spring it to the upward safe position. And then we tested the weight of the complete trigger cycle. What was the trigger safety uh, pressure? Uh, 5.4 ounces. And then what about, uh, can you talk about the pounds of pressure for, for the trigger and how you figure that out? Yeah, for the trigger pull, <coughs> it's 6.84 pounds. And we have some sophisticated digital scales that measure in the uh, hundredth of an ounce that will we round off to the tenth of an ounce because it's, it's really pointless to go any further than that. But uh, we use force gauges to measure all of those tensions. Now, can you just explain to the jury, I don't even know really understand necessarily, the, what do you mean by six pounds to pull that trigger? I mean, if you can explain that to the jury. Well, sure. If you can imagine uh, a jug of bottled water, a gallon jug of bottled water, that weighs eight pounds. So a pound and a half less than what a gallon jug of bottled water weighs if you try to lift it with your index finger. That might give you an idea of what, uh, what it takes to press the trigger on this particular gun. So your finger would essentially need to pull 6.8 pounds to engage that trigger. Correct. Yeah. To pull the trigger back to the point where it was fired to 6.8 pounds. <clears throat> now, is it possible to fire that gun with only one of those safeties? It is not. So all three of them need to all be? All three of them have to be engaged. If any of the three are not engaged, the gun will not fire. Now, the weights and pressures that you put in your report for this firearm, are they all within normal operating parameters? They are. So you didn't see anything unusual about that? Absolutely not. Now, uh, in your experience with Springfield firearms and handguns, um, is 6.8 a lot, a little? What, what, where would you put that in the range? 6.8 is, is right in the center of the range, maybe a little bit on the heavier side, I believe, by the time this gun was manufactured. Trigger pull range was 5.8 to 
the 7.5 pounds, excuse me, 5.5 to 7.5 pounds. Now, how about the functional inspection? Did you uh, form out this pistol? I did. Function, the functional inspection, we assembled the gun <clears throat> just like this. No ammunition. We manipulate the slide, make sure everything felt proper. We actually physically test the function of the grip safety to make sure that it would not fire when the grip safety wasn't depressed. We would then depress the grip safety, make sure the pistol would fire, charge it again. <coughs> we depress the grip safety because we know it works. We depress the grip safety and attempt to press the trigger without depressing the trigger safety. It won't fire. We then depress the trigger safety and then pull the trigger to its furthest travel until it fires. And did it, was it <coughs> when you conducted it did. that? It did and does now. Did you ever conduct the test firing that way? I did. <coughs> <coughs> well, every time we inspect the gun, it's the, the, the proof of the pudding per se is to, uh, once we're comfortable with the guns in normal operating condition, uh, then we test fire with live ammunition. We've got a test fire facility in our in our, our test fire facility in our plant where we test fire all of our guns. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm suffering a bronchial infection. I'm trying to get over so my voice is kind of getting weak. But uh, I thought I function tested this gun with two different types of ammunition, ten rounds each. Uh, one of them was just a generic. 9 millimeter ammunition. The other one was the ammunition that I was uh, told that was in the gun at the time of the incident. I fired that ammunition as well with no incident. Everything worked as normal. And, and you test fired the ammunition, you said? I'm sorry. You test fired ammunition out of that pistol? Yes, two cannons. Now, after you completed the inspection, did you come to any conclusion regarding this pistol? I did. I come to the conclusion that this pistol is in normal and safe operating condition and otherwise could be back in service. I'm going to show you what you want. It's S47 in evidence. <coughs> and can you take a look at that? Yes, it is a uh, nine millimeter spent cartridge case. Spent meaning it had been fired in this gun and ejected. And did you see anything abnormal about that? Not at all. And how do you know that it was that it was fired? Can you talk about that? that? Yes, I'm sorry. Question for me. It's if you could already ask the question or if you can read it back. But by looking at that. Shell pieces, can you tell it had been fired? You can. I mean, the, so, the obvious I, I, I thing. I an objection. I'm not sure if he's being proffered. He had said he, the, the casing was fired from the gun. Did he do that test to make that determination? Is that something he's been told? And he wasn't being yeah. proffered in a comparison expert. I just want to make that clear. Sure. Thank you. If you just lay a little bit more foundation with respect to this witness. That, was that sent to you? <coughs> yes. This program? cartridge case was provided with the pistol. And not this pistol particularly, but can you tell by looking at that casing that it was fired? I can. And how can you tell? Well, first, the most obvious thing is there's no bullet. I mean, a cartridge is made of four components. There's the bullet or the projectile. There's the propellant. There's the primer, which is this, I don't know if you can see it or not, but in a very If you have to get up, we'll show the jury. Sure. So the complete piece of ammunition is called a cartridge. We refer to them generically as bullets. But the bullet is the actual projectile that is fired from the cartridge. So there's the cartridge case, there's a bullet, there's propellant inside, and in the rear, this little silver piece there is the primer. And that's what ignites the propellant charge. When the striker or the firing pin, after you release it with the trigger, moves forward, it hits the primer. Primer ignites, ignites the powder charge and the bullets expand. So right off the bat, there's no bullet in here. You can see that it's been fired. Also, the primer has an indention in the back. In the center of it, it's a little round, spherical indention. 
and that it fell through the crack and was struck by the striker, which ignited the powder and expelled the bullet. This has a normal primer. Primer inventions can vary if things don't go properly. This has a normal primer invention in it, just exactly like the ammunition that I test fired had. So this uh, lets us know that there wasn't any anomaly when the gun was fired as far as the, the, the striker struck it as it normally would, let the normal invention into the primer. You are a state of some protocol. 